Thank you everybody for joining today. Uh, we are on the learning session for the Asthma Quality Improvement Program, Building Knowledge, Confidence, and Change in Primary Care Providers. Uh, technically, this is wave one, but this is a reboot of the program from 10 years ago. So we are very excited about the relaunch of asthma at Ohio AAP. We want to uh, thank our program partner, uh, the Ohio Department of Health Asthma Program. And just right off the bat, uh, let's introduce you to our asthma program team. Um, throughout the course of the program for uh, the next several months, you will be hearing from Dr. Marco. Uh, she is from UH uh, Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. Uh, Dr. Johnson is also from UH Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. Uh, Dr. Hardy will be working with us. He is from Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Uh, our epidemiologist and data analyst is Zainab Al Abdali. Uh, happy to work with her again on a program. And then I am your program manager, Brooke Powell. Um, I will be your main contact for anything program related throughout uh, this wave. Uh, so uh, please think of me as um, someone who can get you answers to your questions and a conduit to any asthma questions that you have for the team. So as a benefit of the program, you have access to our uh, asthma team. You can get uh, pulmonary uh, questions answered that come up in your practice and in your clinic. And then if you need a, an asthma with a primary care perspective, uh, we can always ask Dr. Johnson for her thoughts. Okay, uh, the agenda of today's uh, learning session, I wanna welcome all of you. We will hear um, about asthma and an overview from Dr. Marco, uh, about immunizations and asthma from Dr. Johnson. Uh, we will go over some asthma program information and then program next steps. Okay, if you can, if you're not driving, if you can safely do so, uh, if you can share in the chat uh, your name, your practice, and your motivation for joining the asthma program, please know that we're happy to have you. Okay, Dr. Marco, I have your slides. Great, thank you. Um, uh, so as she uh, already said, uh, my name is Angela Marco. I'm from UH Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital in Cleveland, Ohio. And I am a pediatric pulmonologist with a special interest in asthma and severe asthma. Um, so next slide, please. So just in general, I mean, most people know this, but just to give a broad overview, asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder of the airways. It causes recurrent episodes of wheezing, breathlessness, um, chest tightness, cough, sometimes chest pain. The bronchoconstriction and airflow limitation is generally at least partly reversible, either spontaneously or with bronchodilator treatment. The hallmarks of the disease are this increased airway responsiveness, inflammation of the bronchial walls, and also increased mucus secretion. Next slide. So the reason that this is important is we, um, unfortunately, in Ohio, do live in the asthma belt in an area where asthma is highly prevalent, and we see a lot of it, whether that is in your primary care practice or myself at, um, as an asthma specialist. And so just on the right here, it's the map of the top most challenging places to live with asthma in 2023. And unfortunately, Ohio has taken three spots in the top 20, um, which is uh, a, a challenge that we need to um, work on. And then just on the left here, I want to just highlight um, uh, a couple of stats um, uh, in this bar graph, whereas the U.S. is in orange, Ohio is in yellow, and then because um, I have used this for some Cleveland data, Cleveland is in green, and it goes through asthma prevalence based off of um, race and ethnicity. And as you can see, Ohio in the yellow um, is uh, generally higher in those that are Black or Hispanic or Latinx, and as well higher in um, uh, Ohio and Cleveland. So it's just very important that we um, think thoughtfully um, how to best treat our patients with asthma. Next slide. Um, and so uh, exacerbation epidemiology, it's really important because we know a, a huge um, uh, proportion of children have asthma in the U.S., so about 8%, which is about roughly 6 million children with asthma in the U.S., and of those, about 3.5 million have at least one attack of their asthma um, a year, and that uh, amounts to emergency room visits, hospitalizations, and unfortunately, sometimes death, although rare. Um, and so risk factors um, for uh, exacerbations are a previous severe exacerbation, being the top most um, uh, risk factor, high recent um, uh, SABA use, which is uh, the bronchodilator, uh, poor adherence to their controller medications, difficulty perceiving symptoms, if they have a low socioeconomic status, drug use, um, 
psychosocial problems and other comorbidities such as um, allergic sensitization, sleep apnea, um, uh, food allergies, things like that. Next slide. And so just thinking about asthma inception in course over time, it is um, many things uh, contribute to this. Some of them being um, the host itself. So race, sex, ethnicity, underlying genetics and epigenetics, also the environment in which um, people live. I'm specifically thinking about prenatal environment, where they go to school or daycare, where they live, how much they are exposed to viruses and other allergens, smoke, pollutants, and if old enough, you know, where they work. Um, in addition, other things such as lifestyle, including diet, if they're obese, um, and other comorbid conditions really all affect how asthma um, may start and then how it lasts for that patient over time. Next slide. So thinking about um, asthma in a couple different age ranges, so five years um, old and younger, this diagnosis actually can be quite challenging. Unfortunately, we don't have, um, aren't generally able to get lung function tests, um, the PFTs on these patients to assess uh, if they have reversibility or airflow limitation. And wheezing can occur with or without other asthma symptoms. So oftentimes we can see kids in this age range may wheeze also with just viruses alone. And so the importance is to look for a recurrent pattern of symptoms. Um, in order to do so, you need a really dis detailed physical exam and history. And then um, things that can help clue you into it is maybe if they have a family history of asthma or allergies, or the patient has a personal history of ATP, um, and that may help guide you more towards this is likely asthma. But it's always important to think about red flags because um, um, not all wheezing is asthma. Uh, and so if something seems off or clinically it's just not making sense, it's really important to look at those um, other causes. Um, next slide, thank you. Um, so some features that can suggest a diagnosis of asthma in less than five years old are um, if they have a recurrent cough or wheeze. Cough, um, we tend to see could be worse at night or if they're exercising, um, uh, you know, really worked up crying or if they have tobacco smoke exposure. It can be present with, with or without uh, URI symptoms. Um, same thing with wheezing. In, in terms of activity, they generally can't keep up with other kids. They may be um, complain they're more tired or they may cough or just seem out of breath after exercise. Um, oftentimes there is a family history of allergic disease such as atopic dermatitis, allergic rhinitis, or food allergy. Mm -hmm. And asthma um, in first degree relatives is was something we do generally see with their family history. Um, and in particular, this age range, because we don't have the ability to necessarily get lung function testing, um, oftentimes we do trial asthma medications such as inhaled corticosteroids, um, and uh, we're looking to see if there is improvement with those trial of medications. So in children that are greater than six, or um, six and greater, um, there is, uh, we are starting to notice an emergence of certain molecular basis, so endotypes or certain phenotypes of asthma. Some of these can be broken down into what is IgE-mediated asthma, which is where they'll have an allergen sensitized and high IgE levels. They could be eosinophilic alone without specific allergen sensitization seen on allergy testing, or they could be non-atopic asthma um, in this age range. And then um, separate from those, you can have severe or life-threatening asthma, which could be um, a combination or one of the above. So the diagnosis in these patients, um, similarly, they have a history of respiratory symptoms that vary over time and intensity, but um, generally we're able to um, get lung function testing on these patients so that you can see evidence of variable expiratory um, airflow limitation on this lung function testing. Oftentimes we document an abnormal FEV1 to FVC ratio um, or also a low FEV1. Um, oftentimes it's helpful to get lung function testing and then document change after bronchodilator um, was given. So we often tend to see that um, they may have improvement in these numbers, such as their FEV1 can increase, as well as that FEV1 to FVC ratio. Um, generally accepted is a greater than 12% increase, although you know it's 
extrapolated from some adult data. So that is our generally accepted um, rule of thumb. And then always, if possible, if you have access to spirometry, um, test before treat whenever possible because it can give you more information and guide your diagnosis and the confidence of the asthma diagnosis. Um, and then again, similarly to the previous age range, looking for red flags, things that stick out or don't seem like they fit into the diagnosis of asthma and looking for those alternative diagnoses. Next slide. So this is just an algorithm, um, kind of how I uh, explained previously of um, going through establishing the diagnosis of asthma. So starting at the top in the blue box, if your history and physical exam supports this diagnosis, um, you can go down to yes. Um, and if you have the ability to do spirometry, um, it's best to do it at this time and looking at if there's any bronchodilator reversibility to support that diagnosis. If that's the case, you just kind of go down your arrows to yes and you would treat for asthma. However, we know that it's not always practical to be able to, you know, use have lung function testing available if you have clinical urgency to treat or you really think um you know the there's an alternative diagnosis is unlikely you can start in pair treatment with um uh asthma medications and need to you would we would want you to review the response to ensure that they have improvement with that um if your your history and physical exam does not support this diagnosis then of course we want to look at um, further history and tests um, that could help uh, establish an alternative diagnosis. Um, and so this is just kind of just a broad overview that could potentially help. Next slide. Um, and so these are some of the red flags that I had mentioned before. Um, things that you can see on history review systems or um, in past medical history is if they've got chronic sputum production, persistent noisy breathing, syncope, uh, concerns for dysphagia or hemoptysis, failure to thrive, malnutrition, recurrent infections requiring like multiple antibiotics, failure to respond to their asthma therapy as well. Um, and things on exam that could give you pause is if there is persistent asymmetry to their exam, persistent crackles, if they have um, perhaps maybe a fixed or localized wheeze, Things like strider that's recurrent, um, clubbing on their fingers or toes, and uh, if they have a productive cough at most visits. And then also thinking about if you have a patient that actually never wheezes, that's um, kind of a red flag. So things to think about where you maybe want to expand your testing or refer to um, uh, a specialist. Next slide. So if you feel pretty confident after um, you know, you've done a detailed history and physical exam and gotten lung function testing. Um, at the initial visit, the best thing to do is assess the severity of their asthma. So this chart here on the uh, left is taken from the um, NHLBI asthma guidelines. And so essentially what they want you to do is look at the compo components of severity to determine if this patient is more in the intermittent or persistent, and then classifying it as mild, moderate, or severe. So um, um, here on the uh, left-hand side where the red arrow is, you see the components of severity include impairment, which is essentially the frequency and intensity of daily symptoms. So I like to think of these as the baseline symptoms um, of asthma. And so as you go through that, you know, you basically, as you ask patients questions, you um, ask them about their weekly symptoms and daily symptoms, nighttime awakenings, SABA use, et cetera, and kind of go through based off of their age where they fit in each category. And then below the second component of severity is the risk category. I like to think of this as um, more exacerbations in oral corticosteroid use. And so once you're able to go through and kind of um, determine based off of the questions you're asking your patient, uh, you can help determine if then they're intermittent, persistent, and then mild, moderate, or severe. This will help guide uh, stepwise treatment for management. So if you go down then, so say we, for instance, in this example patient, we feel that this patient is um, a six-year-old. They have um, persistent symptoms that we've classified as mild based off of um, their impairment and risk category. We would go down the line and we would see that it would be recommended step two therapy for treatment. So then we can then go to those um, stepwise guides and select our medications. Next slide. 
And then once you've um, established a diagnosis of asthma and have started therapy at the follow-up visit, which you want to see if this medicine is working for them, if it's providing appropriate control, this is that time we're going to do it. So um, you're going to assess asthma control similarly with the impairment and risk categories. And this is going to be then based off of the categories of well-controlled, not well-controlled, or very poorly controlled. And then you may adjust therapy as necessary. So they'll, sh they'll guide you if you should go up um, a step in the step wise management for medications. And then um, it may also guide you if um, they're not doing well to consider referral to a specialist or further um, testing. Next slide. And so as a management, um, the general principles uh, and goals that we have is risk reduction and symptom control. And so First and foremost is education. Health literacy affects adherence and compliance. Um, we can prescribe medications to every patient with asthma, but if we're not um, educating them on how to use it, when to use it, and how you know to use the equipment with it, it's not gonna be helpful. So going over inhaler technique and using teach back methodology are extremely important to ensure that your patient is able to use it and confident to use it. And then having the patient and family understand how to use their action plan. So what to do in the event of you know, their asthma is worsening to try and keep them out of the emergency room and urgent care or hospital. And then the other important component of it is management should be cyclical and also involve periodic reassessment. So we wanna be able to start asthma medications, but then have the ability to follow up to ensure that it's actually working for them. And oftentimes, you know, they need edu education each appointment because um, perhaps maybe they weren't using the spacer correctly the first time, or they were misunderstood that the controller medication is supposed to be used twice a day rather than as needed, things like that. And that does come up fairly often. And so also, Another important thing to consider when we're doing our treatment is, is there other modifiable risk factors, such as other, you know, things in their environment, exposures to allergens, or do they have other comorbid conditions that need to be treated, such as sleep apnea, allergic rhinitis, um, food allergies, for example. And I just wanted to show the graph, the pie chart that I made here is not based off of any data, it's based off of what I feel. And education, education, education is so important for asthma. Next slide. Um, so our main medications um, are listed here. So first and foremost, inhaled corticosteroids are the kind of the mainstay of treatment. They help um, decrease inflammation and swelling in the airways. So we prefer obviously to use inhaled corticosteroids um, because we want to reduce the risk of uh, adverse effects with frequent oral corticosteroid use. Um, and so as you can see here on this chart on the right, there's so many options and types of devices to use. And so it can be overwhelming um, to decide what is the right one and which one to pick, which is why these stepwise treatment plans can be very helpful. Uh, second is um, the beta-2 agonists. Um, they come in either short-acting or long-acting. And then leukotriene receptor antagonists, um, which the only one approved in pediatrics currently is Montelukast. So that can be a nice add-on therapy. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then once again, like I said, you can prescribe all the medications you want for someone with asthma, but if they don't understand how to use these medications properly, it's just not as helpful as they can be. So every patient with asthma should go home with an asthma action plan. And this should spell out how you treat your asthma every day. So that green zone. So when you feel good or when you feel bad, these are the medicines you take what to do when your symptoms get worse. So when they're at home, how can we prevent them from their asthma worsening that requires them to get to the urgent care or emergency room or need oral corticosteroids? And then how to um, handle exacerbations when they get into the red zone. So what to do when they do start getting worse, should they seek emergency care or is it reasonable to call their physician and things like that. So it helps families at home, but also um, schools too, when they're trying to determine, you know, what are the next best steps? Next slide. And so um, to guide us in this, there are two kind of at least guidelines that we use here in the US. So right here on the left-hand side is the NHLBI um, asthma guidelines. So it was previously last updated in 2007. However, if you click through um, twice, Brooke, um, we have a recent update, which is, um, I guess, a little bit you know, still three years away, but it feels very new and exciting. Um, we've gotten um, 2020 guideline updates. So click through one more time. 
Um, it shows the focused uh, update to the management guidelines. So they looked at six key areas in, um, in, in their work and gave new updates based off of new clinical trial and new evidence-based um, data. And then the other one that we tend to reference as well is called the Global Initiative for Asthma, here indicated on the right. And so the uh, we often um, uh, use the abbreviation GINA for that. This is an international asthma guideline and it's updated every one to two years. So it's nice because it does have more frequent updates. However, the problem with sometimes these multiple guidelines is, is they don't always, um, aren't always the same. And so there are some discrepancies between these two guidelines. And so for the purposes of what we're teaching here, it's probably best to stick with the NHLBI guidelines since this is the North American asthma guidelines. However, if your patient goes to an asthma specialist, such as a, a pulmonologist or allergy, allergist, um, they may you may see some treatment guidelines from the GINA um, guidelines. And so I just, I will call out a couple of them um, because you may see this in patients in your practice. Next slide. Um, so this is just a little background on the NHLBI um, guidelines. So it's uh, created a program called the National Asthma Education and Prevention Program to address the asthma issues in the US. If you click through a couple more times, I got really excited with the animations here. Um, so the first expert panel report was in 1991, and then they've had a few updates uh, since then, 97, 2007, and again in 2020. And so they used the they um, used the grade methodology to look at six priority topics uh, identified for systematic review. Next slide. Uh, these are listed here, and the one we're going to focus on, if you click through, is the intermittent inhaled corticosteroids. Next slide. So I'm just going to briefly highlight um, the the kind of up, key updates that they did in this. Um, but you're more than welcome to go to their website and read um, a little bit further. They have a really nice uh, clinician's guideline, which goes through and explains these a little bit as well, if you'd like more information after this. So a big one is in children zero to four years with recurrent wheezing, they recommend a short course of daily inhaled corticosteroids along with an as needed Saba at the start of a respiratory tract infection. Advance. And children four years and older with mild to moderate persistent asthma who already use inhaled corticosteroid daily, they state that increasing the regular dose of these for short periods is not recommended when symptoms increase or perhaps their peak flow decreases, as it did not seem to um, help them with the exacerbations. Children four and older with moderate to severe persistent asthma, um, the preferred treatment is a single inhaler that contains an inhaled corticosteroid and the bronchodilator famotorol. Oftentimes I refer to it as ICS famotorol. And that is called, um, you'll see, and I talk about this um, in more detail in a couple slides, SMART regimen. So it stands for single maintenance and reliever therapy. It's meant to be used as both a daily asthma controller and for quick relief therapy. And, and then people ages 12 and older with mild asthma may benefit from inhaled corticosteroids alongside a short acting bronchodilator for quick relief. So the importance of that is they we wanna try to get away um, from using the bronchodilators alone without the inhaled corticosteroids since we know inhaled corticosteroids are really the mainstay of treatment for asthma to reduce airway inflammation. Next slide. So SMART therapy, as I mentioned, is single maintenance and reliever therapy. It's a single inhaler. It, it contains the inhaled corticosteroid and the bronchodilator from Motorol. It's meant to be used as your one canister for everything. So it helps um, sometimes with families to say this one inhaler I use for my asthma. It can cut down on the confusion of different colors of inhalers, switching your controller and your reliever because it's all one. It's all together. Next slide. So it reduces the risk of exacerbations for moderate to severe asthma um, when you use it in this approach. And the data on this is actually going back to the early 2000s. The long acting beta agonist must be famotorol. And if you click through, this formulation is important because it has a quick onset of action. So patients will not only, um, when they give that medicine, they will feel relief um, just like they would if they took their albuterol canister. The, the famotorol 
Laba is in um, the combinations budesonide fomoterol, which is brand um, Symbacort, or mimetazone fomoterol, which is brand Dulera. Next. The long-acting beta agonist salmeterol cannot be used in this manner. It does not have a short or quick onset of action. So that's um, example would be like Advair or Air Duo. So Advair or Air Duo cannot be used for this SMART approach. Next slide. Or next um, thing. Uh, Long-term safety studies show that when you use the long-acting beta agonist and combined with the inhaled corticosteroid, it has a similar adverse effect profile if you just use the inhaled corticosteroid alone. So it is safe and effective. Um, and so this is um, taken from the um, newest asthma guidelines for ages 12 and up. If you click through, um, so it's showing that in step one, if you click one more time, um, there, I mentioned that the two guidelines are not completely um, similar, so there are some differences. In this um, NHLBI guideline in step one, they still recommend just using your everyday, um, if you have intermittent symptoms, as needed Saba, so albuterol just as you need it. In the international guidelines, they do recommend using that low dose ICS famoterol um, as your reliever therapy, even when you have intermittent symptoms. If you click through for steps three and four, you can see how um, they have now added the addition of this SMART regimen, which is using the daily and as needed combination low dose ICS famoterol in steps um, three and four. Next slide. And then if you see again in step one, it says as needed Saba. Um, in the GINA guidelines, they do also state they want to start using, have you start use inhaled corticosteroids at this step because they are trying to get away from using um, Saba alone. Um, and so once again, you may see some patients with this depending on if they see an asthma specialist or not. Um, and then steps three and four, again, in ages five to 11 years, are showing that they have added the incorporation of the SMART regimen uh, in these steps. And then the next slide here is going down in age to zero to four. And then in step one, I've highlighted the new um, update from the guideline in that children who have recurrent wheezing, um, oftentimes, you know, in the setting of a viral illness, can start that um, uh short course of daily ICS for seven to 10 days. And then I just wanted to bring your attention to one more thing. If you click through once more, in steps three and four, they highlight that, um, if you go back one, steps three and four, yeah. They highlight that in age four years only, you couldn't use steps three and four um, uh, from the five to 11 year old chart, meaning you can use that SMART approach for patients that are four and up. All right, and so um, half of the battle um, in is understanding how to use the SMART regimen. And so I've already mentioned, we can only use these two formulations that we have currently with famoterol. So if um, looking at the inhaler, I have inhaler, age, the dose, the frequency, and then a maximum puffs that you can use in 24 hours of that inhaler. So the most important things to take away is ages four to 11, you have to, we always use the low medium dose, which is um, in terms of Symbacor or the budesonide fomoterol is the 80 up to 4.5 micrograms. You would use it two puffs twice a day and two puffs every four hours as needed. In ages four to 11, the maximum um, puffs in 24 hours is eight total puffs. And then in ages greater than or equal to 12, it's the same dose. However, their maximum um, number of puffs in 24 hours is 12 total puffs. Um, the only difference with the mometazone fomoterol uh, medication is that it has uh, the formulation you get, fit, you can go 50 micrograms, 100, and 100 micrograms. So they have a true low dose. So in ages 4 to 11, you could either do the low dose of 50 or the medium dose of 100, and it would still be an eight puffs um, total in the 24-hour period. And then again, if they're greater than or equal to 12, the main difference is, is that they have 12 total puffs um, per day. In most clinical studies, when they looked at this, people did not go over this dosing recommendation. And often the guidance I give families when I'm prescribing this medication regimen is that if they're starting to use 
a significant number of puffs, like getting to the total daily allotment, they're likely getting sick or they're not feeling good. And they need to start um, either uh, calling their asthma provider, their pediatrician, and getting some recommendations if they need to be seen or start um, uh, different asthma management for an exacerbation. Next slide. And so this is just an example of how you might write this on a prescription, because that can also um, be confusing. So what I would do is Simbacor 80, um, 4.5 uh, to 4.5 micrograms, um, inhale two puffs twice a day. May also inhale two puffs every four hours as needed for cough, wheeze, or shortness of breath. The maximum number of puffs in 24 hours is eight puffs. It's important to then put in the actual prescription to dispense two inhalers for a 30-day supply. Um, the reason for this is if you are using your prescribed medication, which is um, two puffs morning and night, you will run out of that canister um, within a month, a month, and you would not have any extra puffs if you needed it. You know, you would run out too soon if you had to use extra. So they do need that second inhaler to allow themselves to have um, extra puffs if needed for wheezing or cough. There's a lot of potential challenges with this. Um, uh, many of them revolve around cost, depending on insurance coverage. So most of the time with most Medicaid providers, we can get two inhalers, inhalers covered. However, um, consideration about what inhaler to have at school, because oftentimes we can't get three um, covered. So we have to think, you know, we have to counsel families that perhaps maybe albuterol left at school if they need that versus rather than the Simbacor if we can't get multiple canisters um, for them for this purpose. And then um, requiring repeat education because most of the time patients who may be starting this regimen have had asthma for a period of time or have used albuterol in the past. And so this is a just a new way of using asthma medications and it can be confusing at first. And what I find is even after maybe I've explained this, we write it down, the nurse will go through it again on their action plan. The subsequent appointment, we still have to do a lot of education because they may not quite yet get that this single canister is, um, you know, how, how to use it. Some families catch on really quickly and some just need a little bit more guidance. And so I think um, education is really key with this regimen. Next slide. Um, and so uh, another key highlight I wanted to point out was the intermittent ICS um, for children zero to four with recurrent wheezing. So this recurrent wheezing is, uh, the definition of that is three or more episodes of wheezing triggered by an apparent respiratory tract infection in a child's lifetime or two episodes in the past year and they have no symptoms in between the infections. So they should have no baseline asthma symptoms or symptoms of cough uh, uh, or really anything. And this can be uh, a very nice method to help prevent having to give them an everyday medication, but kind of react in a more as needed approach. Next slide. And so um, again, like previous, I wanted to show you two ways that you might prescribe this. So it can be really any inhaled corticosteroid, obviously with an MDI and spacer, or you can do a nebulized budesonide, for example. So um, for instance, uh, if you were to use fluticasone, you do a slightly higher dose because we're using it as a as needed approach rather than a low dose daily. So you would do fluticasone um, 110 micrograms, and then on the script you'd put at first sign of viral illness, inhale two puffs twice a day with spacer for seven to 10 days. Same thing um, with budesonide. We do do a slightly higher dose since this is for the more as-needed approach. Budesonide one mg um, respirals with the PARI nebulizer, and then again one vial twice a day for seven days. There are potential challenges, again, with this approach as well. Um, you have to have a parent that can identify worsening. Um, so they have to historically have been really um, uh, able to identify like these, these signals that result in the progression of that child to, to develop their um, respiratory illness. And then if using frequently, which can be difficult sometimes because if kids are in daycare or school, they can, um, they can be sick quite often. If you're using it generally more than um, one time a month or, you know, back to back, um, you may need to consider a low dose daily approach um, because then you're giving them a, a much higher dose of inhaled steroid more often. Um, and, and it may just not be the, the right regimen for them. Next slide. And then I just want to briefly 
touch on difficult to treat um, and, and severe asthma. So these are patients that are unable to achieve control despite use of the medium to high dose ICS plus a second controller. Often those would be like a Montelukast or a Spireva. Uh, lack of control can be defined by their persistent symptoms or impaired quality of life, frequent exacerbations, persistently low lung function, um, or if they're having adverse effects of their treatment. So it could be that there are, there are modifiable factors such as adherence or um, exposures in their environment, or it just could be their intrinsic disease. We really um, would prefer if people would refer these patients, if possible, to an asthma specialist, whether that be a pulmonologist or an allergist that does um, asthma care. And so the recommendations by both guidelines do suggest referrals at steps um, three to four, depending on their age. Next slide. And I'm, I've kind of gone over my time, so I don't necessarily need to go over this, but I just want to highlight, because you'll get these, the MDI and spacer technique is incredibly important in how you select the spacer for the, the child's age and developmental um, needs. And so um, being aware that um, a spacer with a mask um, generally is for a child less than five years old, and then oftentimes if they're able to follow directions and make that seal, we tend to see maybe five, six years old, depending on the child, a mouthpiece um, spacer would be um, appropriate. Uh, and so I've gone through a lot. I'm happy to take questions or um, you can email me as well. Thank you, Dr. Marco. Um, for everybody on the call, um, feel free free to unmute and ask a question or put it in the chat, or uh, you can certainly um, email me and I can email Dr. Marco. Um, this just is the start of kind of the back and forth with any questions that you have for the program. Yes, thank you. And I think we could send out the NHLBI um, algorithm pages um, because I think for me, I know my practice, I use those, refer to those frequently, especially if you get familiar with the new updated guidelines. So um, I think we could do that for everybody. Yes, that would actually be really great. And I will actually, I'll show you, I'll do the link for the clinician's guideline, like the update, because then you can at least read, it gives a little more detail and it's very quick and um, easy to go through and it has the stepwise charts. Good suggestion. Thank you so much. Um, for those who joined a little bit late, if you can do so safe, safely, if you could please put your um, name and practice and your motivation for joining the program in the chat. Dr. Johnson, I have your slides. Great. Um, so again, I'm a general pediatrician. Uh, so working in primary care like the rest of you I'm in Cleveland, I'm just gonna just talk a little bit about immunizations and asthma and specific ones that are helpful for kids with asthma. So next slide. Um, so starting with the flu shot, which we're um, you know ramping up our seasons right now for flu and asthma. We just know that patients with uh, asthma have higher complication rates um, from flu, um, worse, they can trigger asthma exacerbations, just actually trigger, uh, make their baseline asthma symptoms worse, precipitate either viral or bacterial pneumonia in kids with asthma as well. Um, we know that um, asthma um, is the most common underlying illness for children who are admitted to the hospital with flu, um, and they actually have um, surprisingly a fourfold increased risk of hospitalization. Um, compared to children um, who um, don't have asthma. So this can be a good um, talking point if you have families that are hesitant about getting um, the flu shot who have asthma, just talking about the increased hospitalization rate may be beneficial. Um, there's different theories on why um, kids with asthma have this increased morbidity. Um, some thoughts are um, due to poor airway clearance of viral particles, um, different kinds of um, issues with their immune system, so higher levels of IL-13, um, increased mucin production, um, different ways that their um, epithelium responds to um, these viral triggers, um, and decreased production of interferon gamma. Again, not knowing all the intricacies, there's lots of different theories and, and not a central theory on this, but um, lots, of, lots of thoughts that there are increased risk for um, complications with influenza specifically. And then kids who are on chronic inhaled corticosteroids, um, thinking about how that may affect um, and decrease their ability to clear these viral particles as well. Oh, Eva, you accidentally muted yourself. Sorry. Um, looking at the uptake of influenza vaccine um, in Ohio, this comes from the CDC. 
um, we see in Ohio, we are at about 71%, um, which is about in the middle, 69% um, over nation, nationwide. So we're, we're above average, um, but still um, have room to grow uh, with getting our kids immunized for influenza. Um, we do know that CDC recommends uh, universal immunization six months plus, um, but specific, specifically we would wanna make sure we're calling this out to patients with um, asthma or viral wheeze. Um, we, there are studies showing that the healthcare uh, providers um, endorsement of this vaccine has significant impacts on patient uptake of it. Um, so again, making sure we're calling this out for families when they're coming in. I actually try to just say, you know, for a one-year-old, you're due for MMR, varicella, hep A, flu, and pneumococcal vaccine. Just put it in there. Like these are ones you're due for, not do you want do you want the flu? Um, after I tell them other ones, because I think that it makes it seem much more optional. This is this is recommended by the CDC that everyone get this vaccine. So again, we should we should be selling it to them as this is a recommended vaccine, not an optional one. Um, so again, um, some people, there has been some, I guess, theories that people see on the internet that the flu vaccine um, is not effective in kids with asthma. Um, there was a big study in 2017 that showed, yes, kids with asthma, the flu vaccine is still effective in reducing asthma exacerbations, hospitalizations, um, and um, increased medication use for asthma. Next slide. So moving on to pneumococcal um, disease and asthma. So there is a new pneumococcal uh, vaccine, the Prevnar 20, um, which has come out. Um, and that's why we're gonna talk a little bit about pneumococcal disease and asthma because the guidelines have changed since the, um, that vaccine has come out. So children with asthma, again, a higher risk for invasive pneumococcal disease um, and pneumonia than not children without asthma. Um, again, a 90% increased odds of invasive pneumococcal disease among children with asthma compared to children, again, without asthma. Um, children um, 5 to 17, um, they had a tenfold greater risk in severe asthma compared um, to those without these at-risk conditions. And then there was a study, um, this was done through the Tennessee Medicaid program. Um, this was children and adults. Um, and again, patients, they all had asthma. Patients with um, asthma had more than a double risk of invasive pneumococcal disease. So different studies showing different things, but overall we know that kids with um, asthma um, have a higher risk for pneumo invasive pneumococcal disease, which is why the guidelines CDC and a um, a a ACIP changed the recommendations for pneumococcal vaccine. So next slide. So um, the vaccine recommendations are a little confusing and, I'll, and I'm, we'll get to more of the details on, on the slide after this, but I'd recommend that providers download this pneumorec vax advisor app, which is the CDC put out um, to help understand who needs the pneumococcal vaccine and when they should get it. Because again, you'll see on the next slide, the rules are very confusing. But in June of this year, um, the CDC um, and ASAP um, changed the recommendations on pneumococcal vaccines. So because of the increased risk of invasive disease in patients with asthma, they were added to the at-risk group and now would be eligible uh, for um, pneumococcal vaccine past our usual time of doing like the Prevnar or um, pneumococcal 15. Um, so they're recommending that you use the, pneumo the PCV20 um, as an option uh, for pneumococcal vaccine or even the PCV um, or the pneumococcal 23. So again, asthma is considered now a risk at risk condition. Um, it's specifically moderate to severe uh, persistent asthma. Um, these patients would qualify um, for um, an increased um, vaccination with pneumococcal vaccine. And this is before it used to be only patients with asthma who were on oral um, corticosteroids were um, eligible, but now it's really any patient with moderate to severe persistent asthma is eligible for this. And the next slide will tell you, show you the very complicated rules here. So I tried to call out the ones that were, I think most applicable to us. So. For, this is just the recommendations for pneumococcal vaccination, uh, again, put out by the CDC. Um, we still go through the regular routine immunization for our you know, under 24 month um, kids, just doing our regular um, PCB15, or you may be, your, your practice is maybe transitioning to the PCB20 vaccines. Um, but then children who are, have completed their normal routine 
of um, pneumococcal vaccination um, who have moderate to severe persistent asthma would be eligible to get additional pneumococcal vaccination. And so that would be, a, say a child you had in your practice today was two and a half who had moderate persistent asthma. They had their four regular Prevnar um, vaccines. They should actually get a, a, pneumoco a PCV20 vaccine. Um, if you've had a, a six-year-old um, moderate, moderate or severe persistent asthma, they should actually be getting um, a, also a PCV20, or um, they'll say you can also get a, um, a 23 um, valent vaccine as well. But you should be giving an extra dose. But again, sort of a complicated um, rules here, so that app can help you decide which patients are eligible. I mean, we know which patients are eligible, the patients with moderate to severe persistent asthma, but when they should be getting those doses of vaccines. But just being aware that with the advent of the new um, PCV20, the CDC and ASIP changed their rules for who would need this extra pneumococcal vaccine booster. Next slide. Um, so then COVID-19 and asthma. So there, this is actually really interesting because um, COVID-19 um, behaves a little differently than influenza and putting kids at increased risk. Um, the majority of studies looking at COVID-19 and asthma found no increased risk of COVID disease, disease severity um, for patients with asthma. Um, the CDC does still put these patients at increased risk, but the, the research so far has not shown um, a significant increased risk for um, more severe COVID-19 disease with patients with asthma. Um, so, but we're still recommending um, that patients would get COVID um, vaccine. Um, again, this is recommended by the CDC. Everyone six months and older should get a COVID vaccine, but just know the data is not supporting that patients would actually have a more severe COVID-19 um, disease with, if they have asthma. And they're again, trying to elucidate why that is, um, the mechanism when why it would be different than influenza, but that, that is where the evidence is showing right now. I don't know if Angela or Dr. Hardy, if you have other um, thoughts on that. Uh, I mean, it's good news, but so, I don't know. summary. Oh, go ahead. I said it's good news, but I don't know why. Um, yeah. So, in summary, really, we we were encouraging vaccination across the board for patients, um, but we know uh, patients with asthma, especially, flu vaccine is extra extra important. Um, and then also being aware of of the changes for the pneumococcal. Um, vaccine for patients with moderate to severe persistent asthma, which is also why it's important. I think we're going to talk a little bit more later about um, having our patients qualified as mild intermittent, mild persistent, moderate, or severe persistent, because that actually will affect um, their vaccination recommendations as well, um, and also help us qualify which um, level of treatment they should be at. So again, many different reasons why we should, um, I know in our practice, we're not always very good about we say they have asthma and not necessarily qualify in our charts, but um, increasing evidence that it's important to, to make a notation of, of where they are um, at the, when you're seeing them qualifying their asthma. So just some asthma vocabulary that we've gone over today, because I know sometimes these terms we throw them around a lot, just a quick reference sheet. Um, one thing, the first one is on here about reactive airway disease, getting away from using these this term for kids that we know are inhaled corticosteroids and, and Really, we consider them asthma. We haven't changed the diagnosis in our chart, just making sure updated in the diagnosis to reflect if they actually have asthma. I know for, um, we talked about um, in our practice, and I know we talked about with our, our leadership team here that sometimes we use reactive airway disease for kids that we're just not really sure, are, are they gonna become asthma or viral wheeze kid early on? It's okay to use that initially, but when they sort of have um, committed themselves on the asthma path, please change the diagnosis so we can be accurate in our, in our terminology. SOB, again, is our short-acting beta agonist. Um, that's albuterol. LABA is the long-acting ones. Like um, Dr. Marco said, promoterol is important to use if you're doing a smart therapy because it's short-onset, long-acting compared to somoterol, which is the long, longer onset, long-acting, which is not indicated for smart therapy. And then you may see in some of the guidelines, they use LAMA, um, which is the long-acting muscarinic antagonist. So the short-acting um, of this would be atrovent, so many people may be familiar with that, but the long-acting one is um, teotropium, which is spiriva. You may see some patients coming back from Palm on that, but just aware that, that sometimes you'll see that on the algorithms that NHLBI puts out as well. And then ICS, again, inhaled corticosteroids. Um, OCS is the oral corticosteroids, and then smart therapy, like Dr. Marco said, the single maintenance and reliever therapy. 
and then ACT, when we refer to that um, as the asthma control test, and we'll talk more about those in further sessions. Any questions? Thank you. Um, any questions from anyone on the call uh, from Dr. Johnson's presentation or Dr. Marcos? Hearing none, thank you both so much for the good information. Um, I will continue on, uh, we do have time, uh, with some asthma program information. Um, we will get into the details on our kickoff calls, uh, but for the learning session, we wanted to provide you an overview on what the program will look like. Uh, so we will be collecting uh, asthma data from you uh, via an asthma collection tool. Um, everything will be housed within the asthma program website. So uh, you'll be going to that a lot during the course of the program. Uh, this is the asthma collection um, form that is embedded in the asthma uh, program website. So all of that is kind of together. Uh, everything is password protected. Uh, so we all need to log in to get into there. Uh, so your username is your email that you provided to me, and then the password is right there. Um, this information is also in the recruitment packet, but anything that you feel you don't have yet, uh, please reach out to me and I will send it your way. Um, on the right, um, this is just kind of a visual uh, to the fields that will be part of the data collection tool. It will be um, a relatively uh, easy to follow um, streamlined uh, form that you can fill out just field by field. Uh, the fields will be required. So um, if you are unsure or you have um, kind of a comment on that patient, we have an other box with a text box. So uh, any questions, any tech related things can be sent my way. Um, this is just further into the data collection tool. Um, this is what it will look like. This is, is how it will read. Um, this is not an all inclusive look. Uh, There's some logic built into here. So um, once you start going through this, I recommend once you have your login to kind of test it out, uh, click through it, see how it works. Um, if you have any questions or um, running into challenges with the functionality, please reach out to me. Um, we can change things in real time. So uh, we will have an open line of communication for the data collection tool and anything else that we talk about. Um, we talked about earlier um, the importance of the asthma action plan. So um, we are building, as far as the Ohio chapter, um, our own branded asthma action plan. But throughout this program, we are going to recommend that you use the action plan that you are currently using. Uh, if you want to try a new one, great. But any asthma action plan that you use is a good one. So if you want to use ours, great. If you are using one that's embedded into your EHR and you can print it out, or if you are handwriting on something that is branded by your institution or that you got from one of the national um, um, companies, uh, that is fine too. We just highly recommend that you use one and that you talk about it with your patients and caregivers. Okay, uh, for next steps of the program, um, through the month of November, uh, we will be scheduling kickoff calls to get uh, to the details of the program and how it works. Uh, please schedule those with me uh, with your uh, availability in November. Uh, again, we'll talk about program implementation, workflow, data collection, all of that good stuff. Um, and then this is available now, so you can complete the asthma pre-work survey. Um, we give you a little bit of time to do that. Um, it is available via this link and QR code on SurveyMonkey. Again, any questions that you have or um, challenges, let me know. Uh, and baseline data collection, uh, this will look like chart review submitted using the same data collection form that we just used. Uh, again, we will talk about this in detail on the kickoff calls. Um, you have uh, November to uh, complete uh, the data collection. Uh, we have come together as a leadership team and took a look at um, all the potential chart reviews um, that could be, we don't want this to be burdensome. So we are uh, encouraging you to um, 
listen to uh, how we were thoughtful about uh, what the baseline data collection could have looked like uh, and where we landed. So that's a little teaser into what, what baseline data collection is going to look like and how we made it more manageable for you for this wave. Uh, so again, the kickoff calls will give you more information. Um, that is the same uh, data collection form link that you saw before. Again, everything will be on the website and everything will be using the same form. Uh, and then we are uh, going to keep this momentum going. So we're going from this um, learning session to our first uh, action period call. So that's going to be Monday, November 13th at 1230 p.m. Um, if I haven't sent you the calendar invite already, I will do so. Uh, all these calls uh, will be recorded for later viewing. That's what makes this uh, program flexible. So uh, eventually, you know, within a couple days of the call, uh, we are able to post things. Everything will be posted on the asthma program website. So another reason to go there to review anything that you may miss, anything that you would like to share with your colleagues or anything that the, you want to re-review. So there's a lot of good information shared today. Maybe it's worth uh, looking at it again. And then I want to pause here. Um, Dr. Hardy, this is your inspiration, but does anybody have um, an asthma-related patient case that you would like to uh, share with the asthma team? Uh, you can certainly email me with this, but maybe start thinking about it um, ahead of the November 13th call. Um, if you have um, something that's actually happening that you would like to um, have it delineated and discussed by our team on the call. I'm happy to uh, take that information uh, from you to our team to talk about. So that's that's going to be some real time and real good information. And um, a plug for our um, annual meeting, which is coming up uh, at the end of next week. So November 3rd and 4th, uh, we are going back to the Hilton uh, Columbus Polaris. Uh, we will have uh, information sessions this year on infant sleep, uh, DEI, our toolkit, uh, which is uh, newly formed and pretty robust and impressive, uh, infant feeding, uh, disaster preparedness, and you can uh, register and attend um, using that link. Um, we hope to see you there. Okay, we covered a lot. Um, if you thought of any questions about the program, about the information shared today, uh, please unmute or please share in the chat. Uh, otherwise, you can email me anytime or you can bring uh, questions that you have to the kickoff call that you schedule with me in November. Thank you. Uh, we're pretty good on time. So I appreciate everybody uh, attending today and for the good information shared. Um, you'll be hearing from us soon and have a good week. Thanks.